Good evening, black people and all allies fighting for black liberation, black prosperity, and black joy. I'm Charles Blow, and welcome to Prime. President Biden traveled to Philadelphia today and delivered what may be his most passionate speech yet about voting rights in America. During the speech, Biden took aim at former President Trump and the Republican Party's claims of voter fraud, a state-by-state -state assault on voting rights, and the stalemate over the Florida People and John Lewis Voting Rights Acts. While Biden blasted Republicans for their opposition to voting rights legislation, he failed to outline a plan to overcome their opposition. Biden seemed to subtly acknowledge that the new voting rights legislation may not be passed by the 2022 midterm elections by announcing that his administration will launch a nationwide campaign to educate voters on the state-by-state -state rule changes and voting restrictions. The power must always be with the people. That's why just like we did in 2020, we have to prepare for 2022. We'll engage in an all-out effort to educate voters about the changing laws, register them to vote, and then get the vote out. Now, last week, Biden met with civil rights leaders who urged him to continue to fight for voting rights despite Republican opposition. According to those who attended the meeting, alterations of the filibuster would be imperative in that fight. Despite this, Biden avoided any mention of any administration effort to alter the filibuster. With Democrats' slim majorities in the Senate, Republican opposition would be impossible to overcome with an intact filibuster. Following Biden's speech, civil rights leaders such as Black Voters Matter co-founder Cliff Albright voiced their disappointment with the lack of actionable plans in the speech. Albright tweeted, it's like listening to a doctor describe in the stalker's terms how dire your illness is and then saying, good luck with that, as he escorts you out of the office. When it comes to the war over voting rights, Biden seemingly has to be dragged to the bully pulpit. And even then, as with today's speech, little to no substance seems to come from him. Joining me now to discuss Biden's speech and where voting rights goes from here is Congresswoman uh, Pram Pramila Jayapal and co-founder of Black Voters Matter, Latasha Brown. Congresswoman, uh, what, did you, what was your take on Biden's speech today? Well, thank you for having me on, and I'm so glad to be on with my sister, Latasha, who's been doing such phenomenal work. Uh, look, I tweeted after the speech that it's very clear what we need to do is reform the filibuster. There is no way that we are going to pass these two incredibly important bills without reforming the filibuster. The Progressive Caucus, which I lead, has been championing eliminating the filibuster. It is a Jim Crow legacy. It is used to stop civil rights legislation from moving forward. And the idea that we have ever had bipartisan support for, fil uh, for civil rights legislation and voting rights legislation in deeply partisan times in this country is just false. That's not how we have gotten things done in this country, unfortunately. And so we need to pass H.R. 1 and we need to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. The two go hand in hand like a glove together. One uh, will stop all of the things that are happening across the country with these 400 bills that are being passed across the country. And the other, of course, is about restoring and expanding the Voting Rights Act. The two need to go together, and the only way to get them done is to reform the filibuster. So I was very disappointed that the president did not speak about that because we need him to lean in to this and to ensure that Democrats in the Senate take this opportunity, because I'll tell you what, when Republicans take over, uh, which they will, if we allow these bills to, to pass and be the law, they will reform the filibuster and they will do it in ways that ensure for uh, the rest of our lives that we never have voting rights across this country. Look, Latasha, you know, it seems to me that uh, it's all civil rights issues and legislation are rhetorical wars as much as they are anything else. And it, I'm sorry, but the president has just not been as fully engaged on the rhetorical side of this war 
as he could have been. It is he just has it. And, and, and you have the leader of the Republican Party, which is still Donald Trump, whoever, you, whoever else you might think it is, has been hammering this for the last six months. Uh, and, and Joe Biden has been feeding us, well, you know, I fixed, you know, I gave everybody a, a shot with the pandemic. That's good. Thank, thank you, Joe. Uh, I want, uh, you know, to get jobs for the hard hats. That's good. Thank you, Joe. But if, if no one can vote, None of that will matter in the end because all of it will turn around because Republicans will take back, o back over control of the House and Senate and possibly the White House uh, in, in 2024. What do you believe has caused Joe Biden to drag his feet on this, which I think is the issue, period? You know, I think that this goes beyond, you know, I said often, while this, it does have implications around what parties in control, there's something deeper here. We're literally talking about fundamentally the strength of democracy. A democratic nation is judged by how people have access to participate in that democracy, right? That's what determines whether it's a strong democracy or not. There's something very egregious about what is happening right now. And I think part of it is, unfortunately, we have lived in this country in a way that it has constantly been the message to Black people people to wait. Just wait to the right time. LBJ did not want to sign the civil rights legislation. Matter of fact, he had to be forced to sign it. And and all, all through all the, the movement that had happened, through the killing, through the murders of folks, there, he had to be forced to sign it. I am saying that, that there is a certain level of comfort, unfortunately, in the political landscape with Black discomfort. There's some, some level of comfort of accepting that if we could just wait, let's just wait until the midterms um, and the sense of urgency, not having a sense of urgency. There are three kind of big points around this. The first point is I think that we have to really squarely say that, yes, we have to end the filibuster, that the filibuster has always been a tool that has been used to be a barrier around civil rights. And no, we cannot wait. It is 2021. This is 60 years past um, of when, we, when the voting rights movement started. And so now we need the end of the filibuster. The second thing is I think we have to, Americans really have to take note at, we have actually gone to war under the guise of, oh, we're protecting democracy. You know, and in the Constitution, it says democracy abroad and domestic. So here we have the biggest threat to democracy of a fundamental right that says people should have access to the ballot. And what we're saying is, oh, maybe if the legislation pass, passes that, then yes, I'll support that. Mm -hmm. The third thing that I think is kind of related to that is I think until we hear or I hear um, President Biden, I think that he had a good speech. I think his speech would have been great maybe 15 years ago. In light of where we are right now, in light of literally understanding that there's been a paradigm shift of who the Republican Party is, who the Republican Party even allows themselves to say they are being very open about, we don't believe in the principles of democracy. Mm -hmm. We don't believe that everybody in America should have access to, to voting. That to really be able to try to shame them, I think that part of his speech mm -hmm. around to shame them, that is not an effect strategy. We have to literally meet what the urgency is of the times. And right now, we're seeing right. the right to vote, particularly related at communities of color, be attacked every single day. And I don't see the same sense of urgency of willing to do whatever it takes to protect that right. Congresswoman, I think you said something that we really need to stop and underscore here. Uh, the, the filibuster is going to be done away with anyway. You know, but we are in the age of nuclear option politics. That to protect voting rights, or the Republicans will do away with it when they take, retake control of the Senate for something else, which will probably not be a good thing. It is going to go anyway. And how will Democrats feel when the Republicans do it, take away, to get, eliminate the filibuster for something horrible, and you had the option to, 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 to amend it or change it or eliminate it in service of giving more people the right to vote and protecting the right to vote for people who already have it. How do you get this through the heads of the people, the, you know, Democrats in Washington, particularly, I don't want to hang this around everybody's neck, particularly Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema? Well, I think that the whole idea that Democrats often come to the table in, in, in the past and certainly right now with voting rights and say, oh, you know, we're the party that is reasonable. And uh, that's great. 
I'm glad that we're off on the party that's reasonable, but we have to understand we are dealing with a party that has no policy that they're fighting for anymore. They are a one-man cult. They believe in the big lie. They're promoting the idea that Joe Biden isn't even the legitimate president and that Donald Trump is going to be reinstated as president. None of them voted for a bipartisan commission to acknowledge what happened on January 6th and the insurrection, and none of them voted for the American Rescue Plan. There is no sense in trying to act like this is a Republican Party, as Latasha said, that is reasonable. They are stripping voting rights because it is the only way that they can win. And they are targeting black voters mm -hmm. and brown voters and poor voters because those are the voters that will most benefit from right. the policies that Democrats are trying to push and are most harmed by the policies that Republicans want to push. So they have two things to run on, voter suppression and, uh, you know, a bizarre, bizarre interpretation of race that is filled with lies and fear mongering. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, and is racist. I mean, let's just be clear about that. So I think that the, what we have to do is continue to keep up the pressure. We need to keep up the pressure on those two Democrats that you mentioned. But let me just say, there are other moderate Democrats who also haven't been as vocal, but are also not coming out to say there is an urgency mm -hmm. now to reform the filibuster. And we have to keep up the pressure on the White right. House because the president does have the bully pulpit. And I think what you said is very important. You know, the urgency and the way in which he can make the case is like no other. I mean, nobody else has that ability that he does of the white him uh, understand. And I thought at one point that he had said he was open to reforming the filibuster. Mm -hmm. He didn't seem to address that at all today. Um, and, right. you know, I found that disappointing right. because it's not going to happen without him really weighing in and saying this needs to Absolutely. happen in order to preserve our democracy. Right. But, but, but Congresswoman, uh, uh, just to illustrate that point, you shouldn't even have to guess whether or not he said it or if it was at some point or not. It should be so clear that a member of Congress should be able to recite back to us uh, verse by verse everything he said about how passionate he was about getting rid of that filibuster. Uh, ladies, we're out of time. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. I'm sure we will have you back on this because this march to disenfranchise American voters continues. Thank you again for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you.